Man, it's, um, you know, I told this in the first series and I'll tell it again. It's so good to watch Nirikshan play his bass every Sunday. You should appreciate him for that. Um, um, it, it is another joy to see our teams go to the mission field and um, serve God. Now, one of the joys of uh, being pastor of this church is to watch our church members on a Sunday uh, to uh, you know, go to other churches to serve. And I think, um, in fact, I keep telling this, that I'd love to see church members go and work um, in remote locations, then come on a Sunday morning and serve here. Um, it, would, it would be a great joy to see more people be on the mission trip. Um, the last Sunday, the one that um, they talked about, uh, Pastor Prakash, is a, is a great man of God. And um, um, it is my privilege to get to know him a um, couple of um, months ago, actually a year ago, I think, I was in this church and was able to teach in the, in the Bible school that it, he runs. And so it was good for me, I know, to get to know him and see the kind of hard work that all of these people dedicatedly, you know, put in. Next Sunday, the, uh, the church that mission, the weekend mission team is going to go to is a pastor we've been associated with for a long time. Um, Prem uh, came to us about, I think about eight years ago, asking us, um, at that time we were in Tabernacle, we were in a different location. Uh, he came to us and asked us, can we help his child? Um, uh, his, I think his younger child uh, had cancer and um, was suffering with cancer. He was 10 years old kid. And we started supporting him uh, for his medical uh, expenses. We um, helped him with all the, um, you know, the process that they need to go through, chemotherapy and stuff like that. And then um, um, when um, he recovered, um, uh, of course, he had to continue with the medicine. So we, that's how we started associating with Prem, who is in Raidurgam. Um, uh, I, think, uh, I think two years, uh, the kid survived, and then um, I, I, God decided that it would be time for the boy to come home to be with Jesus. So um, the boy went to be with the Lord. So, uh, I, and to watch him continue to serve God is a great inspiration for, for us. And I know, um, you know it's one thing to face difficult periods. It's a totally different thing to watch your son die while you're preaching every single Sunday to the congregation that God can heal you. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, to believe that because I'm serving God, my God is gonna take care of my child and to watch your child, the little one, to get wasted away right in front of your eyes and then, um, it takes a lot of commitment to serve God like that. It takes um, faithfulness to serve God. And so uh, it's an honor to be associated with a pastor like that, to support him. And so uh, his younger, uh, elder one, we are, uh, I told Prem, Prem, don't worry about church. Don't worry about your kid, the, uh, the elder one. We will take care of his education as a church. As long as Capstone exists, um, we will make sure that your son is educated well enough into his university, wherever he goes, we are there for, for him. And so... Every, everything we will take care of the boy. And so, um, so he can serve God, continue, without anything. And so it's a joy. So if, if, you, if you're free next Sunday, you don't have to come to church, you can go there and uh, you know, visit Rai Durgam and just be part of that. It's a small group, very small church. Obviously, uh, because he had to focus on his kid, um, uh, the work um, did not take off well. It doesn't mean that he's not faithful. You understand that? Okay, we, yesterday I think in plug-in we talked about how God doesn't care about numbers at all. It doesn't matter how big the church is. What matters is the faithfulness of the person who's serving God. So I think um, you know, it'll, be a, it'll be a good thing for any one of you just to join the team that goes to Rai Durgam um, uh, and talk to Eshwan. So it's a good thing. All right, so uh, first of all, let me clarify two things. For those who are here for the first time, yes, I am the pastor of this church. My name is Chaitanya, uh, <laughs> just in case you have a question mark. And then uh, for those who are here regularly, no, it's not my birthday. <laughs> it's 
Somebody asked me after the service came to me and said, I never see you in this shirt. Is it your birthday? I said, nah. I didn't have anything else to wear. And this looked nice, so I thought I'll wear. That's it. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to go back to the same passage we've been on for a long time, but we've been learning a lot. Today I'm going to focus on just one single word um, in this um, 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 you know, passage and uh, try and uh, talk about a topic that I think we all need to have clarity on. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will fully be prepared. You, you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, God, for this morning. And I want to thank you for the opportunity that you gave us one more time to come into your presence, uh, knowing this, that if we are willing to listen to you, you would speak into our lives. Would you speak to me, God? And... Would you take control of our thoughts? And I pray that your thoughts would be uh, given to us. May you fill us with your thoughts. Uh, may you uh, touch our ears, make us sensitive to hear your voice. May our heart be, uh, uh, you know, uh, be filled with your presence. And God, that may our bodies be attentive uh, in your presence. Uh, speak to us, God. Your servants are listening to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to continue our series called uh, The Armor of God. Uh, four, three weeks ago, I think we, we started talking about what the armor of God is and what Paul is talking about discussing in this, in this particular passage and um, um, opening the reality of our Christian life, saying that we're actually in a spiritual warfare. We're not fighting against people. We're fighting against spiritual dark forces. Um, that people are not really our enemies that Satan uses people uh, in order to create confusion within us and that, that really our enemies, our enemy is actually Satan, not the people itself. And then it becomes easier for us to forgive people if we understand that. Uh, as we are in the spiritual battlefield, uh, spiritual warfare, Paul talked about what is the one thing that can protect us in the battlefield, that um, the armor of God. And of course, we talked about what is the armor of God, what does it symbolize us? each of those things that he listed out there. Then I, uh, we started talking about um, what does it actually mean to walk in authority that God gave us. Uh, last week we talked about what does it actually mean? How, how can we walk in the authority of God? But today I want to talk about a topic called authority uh, trumps access. Authority trumps access. There's one truth about authority that we all need to understand. The authority that God placed in our lives. And I want to talk on that one area of, um, uh, of um, you know, truth that Paul is trying to talk about. And one word that keeps coming back in his passage here is a word called stand firm, verses 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. He starts off like that in verses 10. Now again, he repeats it again saying, Put on the armor so you can stand firm, standing firm. In the battlefield, when your life is full of battles, with people, with things, uh, circumstances, it is necessary for us to stand firm in the battlefield. Now, 
if you've been following us, a um, couple of weeks ago, I talked about standing firm requires two kinds of mindsets. One is confidence that I can do this. If you are facing an enemy who is strong, who is terrorizing, for you not to leave the battle, you need confidence that I can fight this. But if you don't have the confidence or the power to fight, then at least you should have an assurance that somebody who is stronger is beside you. That you know, oh, there is somebody who is standing with me, he can fight for me. Right? Only then you can actually stand in the battlefield, otherwise you will run away from the battlefield. Now, uh, what if you don't have the strength and you find yourself in the battlefield, you feel like you want to believe somebody is behind me, Unfortunately for most of us, we find that the person who says I am with you doesn't seem to be appearing. That's why many times when we are struggling in life, the first thing that we tell God is, where are you? That's why our faith goes down, up and down in most of our difficult periods is because we are questioning, is God really here? I want to believe God is with me, but I don't see him anywhere. Uh, and he, here is the most interesting thing that at the time that you are in this uh, you, you are in an intense battlefield I mean whatever battlefield you are in at that time it feels like God is not talking to you at all you remember I mean, have you gone through that experience that you are praying and praying and praying hoping that he would talk to you but you don't feel like I don't hear anything I don't even feel that he is with me it is at that time it becomes difficult for us to stand firm. Now, if he physically is present, then yes, maybe we will. But if he is not and we don't feel like he's around, why would we continue to stand in the battlefield and it doesn't make sense to us? We want to run away from that. So, I began to wonder, why, why would then Paul tell us that he knows that there will be situations like this in our lives? Why would then Paul tell us to stand firm and then it, it kind of dawned on to me that there is a third possibility. And that is this. That if you see all the others falling down and you are in the battlefield alone and the king comes to you and then says, others are falling down, your comrades are falling down. Uh, I am giving you the authority as a commander. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now you received authority that without that you would have actually walked away but now that you have authority you don't have a choice but to stand in the battlefield um, this morning I was uh, uh, talking about a, a movie called Hawks are Ridge I think um, where in the, in the intense battle um, uh, you know, the, 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 the group, uh, the fighters, the, the soldiers, one of the other is, is dying. The guy who's leading them actually died. So this, 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 this um, uh, private informs the commander who is down saying, the captain is dead. Uh, and so the, the guy who's down says, well, congratulations, you now become the captain. You see that? This guy is a private. He, he probably doesn't know how to lead people. But then the commander down says, now since nobody else is there, you got the authority, go, go do it. He doesn't have a choice but to now stand in the battlefield and continue to fight. You see the point? The authority. What we need to realize is God placed that authority in our lives, that kind of authority in our lives the day we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal savior. And that cannot uh, 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 that uh, uh, will not allow Satan to have any control over our lives, any authority over our lives. Now, let me clarify these two terms, authority and access. When you sin, disobey God, you open doors for Satan to have an access into your life. Right? You are disobeying God, you open doors to... And all of us are, are, you know, by nature we are sinful. Even though we are Christians, we do fail. We do disobey God. And when we disobey and sin, we open doors for Satan to have an access into our lives. Now the access of Satan does not mean he has authority over our lives. 
I'll explain that. That's the first thing that I want you to understand. Access does not mean authority. I, I like the uh, story, um, um, the narrative in Esther, the book of Esther. I, I don't know if you know the story of Esther. Uh, I'm sure you know, probably you don't know the full details, but a bit of it, what, what, actually, what actually took place. How Esther became the queen, and once she's uh, in, the, um, in the palace, um, she comes to know that there's a guy called Haman who planned to destroy all the Jews, and her uncle Mordecai told her, this is what's happening, you got to do something about this. As a queen, you have an opportunity to, um, to talk to the king and change this edict. Um, so uh, th that's basically the story of how Esther saved her people, the entire book. This guy Haman, the villain, the main villain of the story, is a descendant of a person called Agag. Now who is Agag? Agag was the, um, an Amalekite. Amalekites were those whom God specifically instructed um, uh, Saul to be destroyed. Destroy these fellows. These are going to be a problem to you in the future. Destroy everything that belongs to them. But Saul goes as a king years ago, hundreds of years ago. Saul goes into the battlefield, does not destroy everybody because he thinks something can be spared. And he actually spared the king of Amalekites, whose name is Agag. Now, somehow Agag es escapes later on, and he, you know, his lineage continues, ends up at this particular time, in Esther's time, in the form of Haman. Now, Haman grew up with hatred towards Jews. His situation is what it is because of Jews, right? Otherwise, he would have been a king. He is now in some strange country working under somebody. So he had hatred towards Jews. He wanted to destroy Jews. That was his life goal. So in order to achieve his life goal, he planned a career path that he would come to a place where he can actually do that. Okay? And Haman achieved it. His career was actually, he's a very strategic guy. He planned well in order to reach to a place where he would have an access to the guy who is an authority who will then give, me, give him the permission to destroy Jews? So Haman reached to a place of what we, what we could call a prime minister. He is prince among the princes. Oh, so he's over the cabinet, the entire cabinet of the king, King Artaxerxes. He reached there, that position. Now, as he is there, he is now setting about planning on destroying the people, Jews. Now he can do it because he has access to the king. Because he has his ac access to the king, he can also go to anything that belongs to the king. He goes into the palace. Every morning he gets up, walks into the palace. He has an access to the palace. He roams around in the palace. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, that's the reason I put it there. Say, it, it's a very interesting thing that every day, Haman would get into the palace and everybody would bow down to Haman. He has an access to the palace. Now, the palace is where Queen Esther lives. You, you get the picture now? So Haman has access to everything in the palace. He is also planning to destroy Jews within that palace. But he has no authority over Queen Esther. He can go into the home, but not touch her. He can plan against Jews, but he cannot do anything to her. Haman, you see that? He has an access. Doors are open. He can come in, but he can't do anything. When you sin, you open doors for Satan to come into your life. You're opening doors to come into your home, your relationships, your family. He can, because you sinned, because you disobeyed God, either because of idolatry. Idolatry does not necessarily mean worshipping idol. Anything that replaces God is an idolatry, by the way. Okay? So if your job is your idol, that's your God, not Jesus. Um, if your business is your idol, that's your God. If something else takes the place of Jesus, more priority, that's God. So idolatry. If you do that, you allowed Satan to have an access to your life. He can have an access. The thing is this, as a believer, you and I need to realize that he does not have authority over you. He can have access, he can attack you, he can try and hurt you, Jesus, that's why I said the thief, uh, the, the, uh, Satan comes to steal, 
destroy and kill. Kill, destroy and steal, whichever. If he can't kill you, he will try and destroy you. If he cannot destroy you, he will try and steal from you. But that's all he can do. More than that, he cannot do anything else. And even that, God has to give him permission to do. You remember Job's case? Right? Satan cannot touch anyone who belongs to God unless God says, all right, I'll give you permission right now. Made sense to you right now? So you, you as a believer in Jesus Christ, you actually belong to Jesus. The king is your bridegroom. The king is your king. You are his, you know, we as a church, we are his queen. His queen. We build a bride. Jesus calls us bride. His bride as a church. So we technically belong to the king. Even though Satan is trying to attack us, he does not have authority over our lives. He cannot. What he would like for you to think is that he has authority. You see, sin can give an access for Satan uh, to attack you, but he cannot have ownership over you. Your children don't belong to him. Your family doesn't belong to him. Nothing that you, God gave you belongs to him. You have the authority in your life. The authority of believer is greater than the access of the enemy in his life. The reason I, I went to, I understood that I need to talk about this part is because standing firm requires authority. When you, when you, the, 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 the reason you will stand firm is because you now know, because I have the authority, I have the responsibility. I have the responsibility to defend myself. I have the responsibility to defend my wife. I have the responsibility to defend my children. I have the responsibility to defend what God gave me as a responsibility. And now I have the authority to fight for it. No matter what access you have given to Satan, because you opened a, a door for him, uh, no matter how far he has gone on destroying your marriage, your relationships, or your professional life, or your life, in Christ, you still have the authority to close the door to him. God gave you that authority. Now, that authority comes from Jesus. That is the second truth you and I need to understand. Authority because of Jesus, not because of religion you believe in. Not because you came to Capstone, but because you believe in Jesus. There's a difference, right? You, most of us, follow preachers and because we follow preachers and pastors we mess up our lives when we begin to follow Jesus everything changes you, you get the picture now, right now John uh, Luke chapter 10 what is Jesus saying look at what Jesus is saying and I think we all need to pay attention to this Luke chapter 10 verses 18 and he said to them I saw Satan fall like a lightning from heaven I'll come to that in the next point, but let's move on. Behold, I give you the authority. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means hurt you. Wait a second. This statement is coming out of the mouth of Jesus, not from somebody, okay? This is out of the mouth of Jesus to a people, group of people who are still immature. All these apostles are still immature. They are still struggling in their own walk with God. You know, they are following Jesus, but they are still struggling in their faith. And sometimes Peter is like the strongest guy uh, I, in professing his faith. The other times he's like uh, looking at Jesus and calling Jesus a devil. You remember those, those, those you know, uh, times, right? So, so you got these people who are vacillating in their faith and Jesus looks at them and says, I give you the authority. They are not even filled by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, I give you the authority. For us, it's a totally different thing. 
we are not like those. We already believed in Jesus and we already have Holy Spirit within us. We are on a different level now. Now, um, um, somebody, uh, you know, tried to compare that in, in this illustration. I think it's a beautiful one. Um, power is like a gun given to a police officer. But authority is the badge that he got. Okay? Now listen, even if he doesn't have the gun, because he has a badge, nobody wants to do anything with him. If you just have the uniform, most of us, when we see a uniform, we're like, we're not to do anything with these fellas. Right? For whatever reason. We just don't want to do anything with them. Just because the badge says that he has got the authority. He still hasn't, he may be weaker than you, but if he has uniform, he got, you don't want to mess with him. Uh, that's why criminals stay away from police. Even if they see a police officer, even if it, that fellow doesn't have a gun, you just don't want to mess with that person. Satan is a criminal. You may look like a weakling, but because you have the authority, you are stronger than him. He, will, he should be the one who is afraid of you, not you. You shouldn't be living in a fear that what would Satan do? What would the evil spirits do to me? What would this do to my family? You shouldn't be the one who is afraid. He should be the one who is afraid. Actually, he's afraid of you. He's afraid that you would use that authority. Now, the Holy Spirit, when he fills you, he brought you the power, the gun. So you now got both of them in your hand. And why would we live in constant fear all the time? That something will go wrong, something would happen to us, something would happen to our families. Now this authority came to us because we believe in Jesus. Not because of the religion we are following. That we must understand. Um, one of the most fascinating stories, but not the story, the narratives in the Bible is a conversation, for me it's a great conversation, between a, guy, a centurion and Jesus. A centurion walked up to Jesus one day and said, Jesus, uh, my, my servant, who I consider my child, is sick, is almost dying. Would you heal him? Now Jesus was amused that a centurion actually walked up to him and asked him. Uh, Romans don't go asking for help from a Jew, right? So, but, uh, but a Roman centurion, that too, walked up to Jesus, uh, who is an you know, itinerant preacher, at, you know, road, street, street preacher Jesus was at that part of the time. Uh, and he comes to Jesus and says, can you, can you heal my, my child? Now, of course, he must have heard that Jesus is doing some of this stuff. So he walked up to Jesus. And, so Jesus is extremely amused that he actually came, said, all right, I like you. I want to go to your home. So Jesus says, let's go. What centurion said after that, Completely took everybody by surprise, at least Jesus by surprise. He looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, I understand authority. You see that? Look at the phrasing of uh, his words, huh? his, what he's saying to Jesus. I understand authority. I'm a man of authority. The people who work with me, my servants, will come to me if I say, come. If I tell them to go, they'll go. I understand how authority works. Now, you can stand here and tell my child to be healed and he'll be healed. If you and me were there, we would have asked Jesus to come to our home. We would have given him biryani and, you know, offering and then send him. Look at the faith. Look at the understanding of authority. Isn't Christians supposed to be like that? Aren't we supposed to be like that? This guy is a non-believer. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. You and I know everything about Jesus. We've experienced his power in our lives. Aren't we supposed to behave like him? Saying that the same authority that he can exercise, he says, I give you that authority. 
But we don't live like that. We always are worried because we are taught like that. That we should be afraid of spiritual warfare. Most of us Christians, we don't like to dabble anything about spiritual warfare. The moment spiritual warfare, a wording like that, any, any, any teaching from that side, you're like, oh my God, next few months you're going to be. I don't want to listen to any of this. We like quiet Christian lives. We like going to church on a Sunday morning. We like giving our tithes regularly. We like smiling at people, and you know, and which are all good, okay? Please smile. <laughs> which are all good. We don't like to talk about spiritual warfare. We don't like to talk about things that we feel like we don't want to understand. We don't want to dabble, dabble in those. But the problem is it's a reality that you are in the middle of that battlefield. And the reason I think we kind of stay away from that is because we think that if I get into a spiritual warfare, any of these things, Satan will attack me. If we will have a dire consequence, negative consequences, maybe he will attack my family, maybe he will bring uh, accidents and, and, uh, and uh, maybe you know, some nightmares will come in the night, whatever. Um, uh, you, know? uh, you kind of feel that if I challenge the devil, then devil will try and attack me and so therefore I don't want to do anything, anything like that. I want to sleep well in the night. That's probably how our mindset is. And that's why we don't try and get, talk about that. We don't even want to get involved in that. Here is the problem. Devil wants you to be like that. Because you, a man of authority, not doing anything is much easier for him to do anything he wants. Right? If a cop sits quiet, not do anything, criminal will go berserk. He will do whatever he wants because the cop is not going to do anything anyway. Actually, I think church-going, quiet Christians are much a be better assets to devil. I still want you to come to church, by the way, okay? But I'm just saying. What devil is afraid of is those Christians who understand their authority. He's afraid of those Christians who then exercise that authority, who live by that kind of faith, who move in that direction. Talk to devil and say, you don't have any authority over my life. Not my children, not my family, nothing. You don't have authority. You see what I'm saying? As long as you're afraid, he's happy. As long as you don't use that authority, he's happy. And Jesus said, when Jesus said, I give you the authority to trample serpents and scorpions. He did not add a disclaimer by saying, hey, listen, uh, when you do that, scorpions will turn back and beat you, bite you, and, or a snake would bite you. He didn't do disclaimers there. Did you see that? He never warned them, be careful, huh? backlash will come. He didn't say that. How come? It means Satan cannot actually do anything to us. Now, he may try and attack us. There may be times where certain circumstances would turn out to be in such a way that we may feel hurt for some time. And uh, uh, how do we look at that next point? I'll come to that. When that does happen, we understand. Um, uh, you know, we feel like, oh, that is going to happen. That is happening. So therefore, I shouldn't meddle with this anything. But Jesus... Jesus never talked about possible backlash. He actually talked to imperfect believers and gave them the authority. He said, do it. The only warning Jesus gave is that don't gloat in your victories. I'll come to that. He said, don't try, don't try to think you are the one who did it. That's all he said. I, yeah, I'm giving the authority. So remember, the authority is me, not you. But I am sharing that authority with you so that you can live a victorious life. You can, you know, you can uh, defend yourself against the attack of, at, attacks of the enemy. Um, I'm not saying devil won't try and attack us back. I'm not saying devil cannot hurt us. I'm not saying that, the, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that um, um, sometimes, you know, we find ourselves in a difficult situation as people who are walking in authority. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you should not be afraid of the devil. 
That's not a, that's all I'm trying to tell you. That your authority is much higher than what devil has in his hand. Because it comes from Jesus. We have the authority that comes from Jesus. Um, listen, being in the will of God is the safest place on the earth. Last night we had a, well in fact yesterday was a fantastic day. We had a great conversation in the morning with men's group and then we had a great conversation in the evening in our plug-in still. I, I was at a plug-in and we talked about will of God in our lives. How do we know what is the will of God in our lives, right? Just now I said the safest place for us to be is in the will of God. So the safest place on the earth is to be in the will of God. Now, if I, I'm not going to go to that topic right now. So don't, don't expect me to answer right now, which I will not do. It's not going to happen this today. But the, the this discussion was on, how do I know what is the will of God at this point of my life? Okay? And we, we talked at length and tried to understand how God functions in this world, how God functions in a Christian's life. And directs us, directs our paths, or helps us to make good decisions. We, talk, we talked about that. But here is what one conclusion that you know we all came to, and we, we tried to understand. There is a goal in God's mind for earth, for all those who live on the earth, and that is this: that every tribe, every tongue, every nation in this world should confess the name of Jesus and bow down at the feet of Jesus. That's the goal of God. Entire book of Revelation is all about that. Okay? The goal of God is that every tribe, every tongue, every nation should bow at the feet of God. That he wants to achieve. And he will achieve that through believers. That's why he placed a call upon all our lives. Each of us have a call. One singular call. There's no other call. And that call is this. Go to the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples of all nations. Meaning every single one of you, including me, we have one single call and that is to preach the gospel. That's the purpose of God for your life, for my life. It means wherever you are, whichever part of the world you are in, whichever country you are in, whichever situation you find yourself, whatever profession you find yourself doing, whichever position you are in in your profession, whether you are uh, uh, at the top of your company or you are uh, in the, uh, at, the, at the lowest rung of your company or whether you're a student uh, or a homemaker, doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter at all. What your job title is doesn't matter at all. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, your primary purpose in this world, the moment you become a Christian, is that you preach the gospel. That's it. That's the goal of God. That's the will of God for your life. So don't ever question, what is the will of God for my life? He already clarified it. My will for your life is that you preach the gospel. Now some of us are saying, I don't know how to preach the gospel. Right? I'm not like you, pastor. Most people would say that. Okay? I, I, we don't know how to say. Now that's why Paul kind of extended a little more and he said, listen, live your lives worthy of the gospel that you profess. Meaning, when you say I'm a Christian, live like a Christian. That's how you preach the gospel. Through your lifestyle. Through everything that you do. If you say, I believe in Jesus, show that you are believing in Jesus. If you say, Jesus uh, uh, can bring me out of this, this, this particular situation, if you actually believe that God is powerful enough to, do, to uh, deliver me, behave like that. Believe that. That is possible. There's a, um, uh, you know, th there's a way to... Sh don't worry about him, okay? As long as he doesn't, dist he doesn't disturb me. Don't worry about him. Um, he should not disturb you. He should listen to me. As long as you live your life as according to the faith that you profess, that is the gospel that you're communicating. And you are in the will of God. Now, here is the beauty. Everything that happens in our life, God works it for our good. You remember the verse? Romans chapter 8, verses 29. But the thing is this, that verse is only possible when you meet two qualifiers that you know, he talks about. Number one, Everything will work out good for those who love him. 
That's the first qualifier. You must love God, not with your mouth, but from here. You must love God. The second qualifier is, and are called according to his purpose, meaning those who are doing the will of God. What is the will of God? I just shared with you. What is the will of God? That you should share the gospel. That is the will of God for your life. When you don't do the will of God, nothing will work out good for you. That's what I'm trying to say. All things will work out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Most of us don't do the purpose of God because we are not really in love with God. You may say, I love God, but you're not. If you're not doing that, that means you're not doing this. If you say you love me, you obey my commands. Jesus said that. Talking to his disciples, he said that, right? If you say you love me, you should obey my commands. If you obey my commands, that's how you show you love me. Now what the command? Go and preach the gospel. How come you say, I love Jesus, but don't do the one, one thing that Jesus asked you to do? Yeah, you may not be able to communicate, but how come you're not living like that? How come nobody's interested in your faith? How come nobody sees you're different from the others? You get the picture now? That's what. So when you are that, when you love God, you will automatically do the will of God. And when you do the will of God, everything that happens in your life will work out for your own good. So really, so really the question should not be, should I, should, I got two job offers, which job offer should I go to? What is the will of God for my life? That's not the question at all. Don't worry about that at all. Make any choice you think is a good thing. That's not the problem. The problem is, am I doing what God is actually asking me to do? When you do that, you are in the safest place. Because your faith is in Jesus, not in religion, not in some preacher, uh, not in, you know, what you hear from others, but it is in Jesus. And that will give you the authority. And here is the third thing. Listen, here is the third thing that you and I need to remember that devil is defeated. Third or fourth thing, I don't know which one is this. Devil is defeated. Okay, let me paint this for you. Okay, now it, it may seem like a simple statement, but you really need to listen to this. Now, if you're a cricket player, or if you, at least you understand the concept of cricket. You don't have to be a Mets Dhoni fan, okay? I, <laughs> every time I talk about cricket, I will talk about Dhoni. So don't worry about that part. And um, even if Dhoni is retired, it doesn't matter to me. He's, he's the greatest leader I've ever seen uh, uh, you know, in a secular world, I think, is a brilliant guy. Um, you understand how cricket works, right? The 20 hours, 50 hours, it doesn't matter. The, f the guys who bat first, Set a target for the guys who bat second. And the guys who bat second must finish, achieve the target within the time uh, um, overs that they need to. Now, imagine this. The, the team that is batting second is chasing a particular target. Now, they have reached the 49th over, 50th over. You got six balls that they need to, they can use now. The bowler can bowl six balls. And the batter has to hit 36 runs. Now, if you understand cricket, you know 36 runs is possibility. So the team that is fielding is always going to be nervous. Because nobody knows who can do a Yuvraj, right? So there is a possibility that 36 can happen. Even 38 is also possible. Because who knows the bowler can bowl a wide or a... No ball, anything is possible. So there's always going to be a tension in the fielding team. You are going to fight to win the match with a fear inside you. You're like, what if that fellow hits every ball for a sixer or, or something like that? And you're going to always fight with a fear because you don't know whether you're going to win or 
loose. Your frame of mind is, is going to be that. But what if? The ball, uh, you know, the, there is only one over, six balls left, but 80 runs to chase. Just think about this. What if there is 80 runs to chase? How do you think the fielding team's mind frame would be? Think, think if you, you're like, I don't care what he does now. Right, it doesn't really matter. Even if he hits every single ball for a six, and even if our bowler bowls 10 wides, I'm still going to be safe. I'm going to win this. I, I really do, it really doesn't matter. The entire body language changes. The way you feel the changes. You don't really bother now anymore about the runs being hit because you know you got enough score on the board that they would never be able to chase as long as you bowl straight. Get the picture now? Now, you do need to bowl the last over. You can't walk up to the empire and say, hey, six balls, 80 runs, those fellas will never going to win. Let's not bowl, let's finish the game. You can't do that. You still got to bowl the last six balls. But now you are bowling with the confidence that I already won this match. That is what Paul is trying to say there. He is already finished. Satan is already finished. You got to know that Jesus already destroyed Satan on, on the cross. He really doesn't have any authority over your life. Keep bowling till I come back. That's all he's saying. Does that make sense now? I want to show you one verse that, that kind of opens your eyes to see like, oh, is that the state of devil, okay? Look at what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 15. He's saying, this fellow, this devil, is actually defeated. How bad he was defeated? Look at what he's saying. Having disarmed the principalities and the powers... He made a public spectacle of them. Listen, go back and reread it. He made a public, it's not just a quiet defeat. It's a glorious victory and such a glorious victory that Jesus made a public spectacle of them. You know, the terminology that Paul is trying to use is, this is how in ancient warfare, after a king who conquers another king, he would then take that defeated one and parade him in front of people and most of times strip off the royal robes put them in chains and sometimes even naked strip off everything make them stand in front of the people his own land and make them parade in front of them you understand the figure of speech what Paul is trying to use that's how Satan has been paraded long back 2000 years ago not today but long back finished Really, he is not somebody who has authority over your life. You should not be afraid of him. He's defeated. Play the game from there. With that mindset. Now imagine, if your frame of mind is like that, do you think anything that is happening around you would affect you at all? Now you may feel scared for some time. You may wonder, why is this happening? But do you think it will change your commitment to God? Do you think it will change your faithfulness towards God? Do you, you won't because you know I'm already one. No, I know I'm an imperfect person. I know I'm going to mess up sometimes. But what I know is where Satan is going and where I am going. That's why the book of Revelation. The reason I made that verse there, uh, if you look at chapter 12, verses 7 to 12, it clarifies the state of Satan tomorrow. In the present, he's walking in chains. He's roaring, but he's not really going to do anything. He's, a, he's, he's already made a public spectacle today. Yesterday, he fell down from heaven. Today, he's walking like a public spectacle, you know, uh, 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 a defeated king. He's walking in front of you, paraded. Tomorrow, Revelation chapter, chapter 12, verses 7 to 12, describes what happens to Satan. That he would be utterly destroyed. He would actually be destroyed by you. Do you know that? 
scripture actually explains in chapter 7, sorry, chapter 12. Uh, um, um, 12. Uh, look at what um, um, the, the Revelation, the book of Revelation. He was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The accuser of the brethren has been cast down and they overcame. I'm, I'm actually reading between verses, okay? Just trying to string up the thought. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Do you know who these they are? You and me. By the blood of Jesus that we hold, we have defeated the Satan. We will defeat the Satan. And by the word of our testimony, that is what he's afraid of. That's what he doesn't want you to believe in, the word of God. When you believe in the word of God, you will profess by faith. When you have doubt on the word of God, He's got a grip on your life. See the picture now? So stand in the victory of God. That's, you don't fight for victory anymore. You fight from the position of the victory. So Paul is saying, all you got to do is put on the armor, stand there. He's already defeated. In Romans chapter 8, verses 37, he says, you are more than a conqueror. When you read the, a statement like that, you, you, you probably ignore it most of the time. Yeah. Have you ever paused long enough to understand what does it mean by more than conqueror? We are, you know what conqueror means, right? A conqueror is someone who has a victory after the battle. That's a conqueror. I go, I fight against somebody, I win the battle, I'm a conqueror. But what does it actually mean by more than a conqueror? Hey, you know what Paul is trying to say? Listen, you don't even get to fight. God is going to fight. He's already won it. What God is doing right now is sharing that victory with you. So in that sense, he's, you're more than a conqueror. You're not a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror because God is the one who conquered the enemy and is saying, enjoy the spoils. Give you the victory. That's why he goes on to explain nothing. And when he says nothing, it means nothing. He says nothing in heaven, on earth, nothing under the earth, no power, no angel, not even demon. Huh? He says no angel, forget about demons. Not even an angel can touch you. Because of the love of God that is in Jesus Christ for you. You are a totally different beast, huh? I shouldn't have used that word, but you're a totally different person in Christ. Uh, that authority nobody else has. So don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. Devil is defeated. And because devil is defeated, he does not have any control over your life. We need to understand that part. He may have, as I told you, he may have access in some parts of your life but there are parts in your life where he doesn't have access, control. And those parts in your life that does not have control, devil's control, are more stronger than the ones that he has control over. Now, at this point of time, I will sound heretical right now, okay? Don't, don't, don't be scared of me. Listen to this. I just want to give you a different perspective of a passage that we would have read like thousand times. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is an incident um, where Jesus delivered a man who was possessed by thousand demons. Okay, remember that. Uh, in fact, he called himself, I am possessed by a legion. Re remember that? It's a place called Gerasenes. Jesus, along with his disciples, came to this place called Gerasenes. And there was this man who is possessed by thousand demons, was um, chained so that he would not hurt others or himself. There he is in the graveyard. But something interesting happens when Jesus walked into, uh, onto the shore and then walked towards him. Uh, by, by the time you come to verses 5, I think you see, this man ran towards Jesus. Now picture this. You got thousand demons inside you and you are running towards Jesus. Okay, Keep that in your mind. And he comes and falls down 
Bible actually says he worshipped him. Bowed and worshipped him. Then he shrieked out. The next verse is, he shrieked out, son of God, what do you have with me? Basically it means, uh, you are, you're a son of God, I'm a devil, why, what do you have with me? Kind of thing. Now I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm pausing and I'm thinking, wait a second. If I have devil inside me, why would the devil let me go to Jesus? You, you understand what I'm saying? If I have devil in me, the goal of devil is to, to steal, kill and destroy, right? That is his goal. And he knows if I go to Jesus, I'll be delivered. Why would he let me go there? He shouldn't, right? He shouldn't. If I am actually possessed by not one but thousand, I should never go to Jesus. Every instinct inside me will tell me, don't go, don't go, don't go. Forget about demon possession. If you have experienced one failure on a Saturday evening, you will not come to church Sunday morning. Let's be honest. If, if you have one defeat on Saturday evening, what if on a Saturday evening you got the pink slip? I don't know if you still call it a pink slip or whatever. Now I think everything is getting done in Zoom, right? Maybe they'll flash the pink Zoom background. I don't know what they do. Now, when they lay you off, if that happens on a Saturday evening, would you come on a Sunday morning to church? I can, give my, I, I can bet my life on you that you will not come to church. You're going to be really upset with God. And you're going to say, nah. If God can't even protect my job, why would I go to church? So even a slightest disappointment in our life can pull us away from God. And if I'm possessed by a thousand demons, why would I even walk to Jesus? But this man came running to Jesus and bowed down and worshipped him. Then the demon inside him spoke. And I'm thinking, what if? I'm just thinking, what if? Okay? What if? I love, I love the scripture. I want you to know I, 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 uh, I'm a very serious follower of interpretation, okay? But just for this sake, just for this moment's sake, I wanted to take a step back and imagine what if there is an ounce, there is a part in his life where he still has control over him. That part of his mind, a will, which said, I know everything in me is pushing me back, but I know that is the only place where I can find hope. And what if that strong will pushed him in spite of the devils pulling him back. That strong will inside him saying, I know I can, I need to go to Jesus. That's where I find my freedom. And that one step helped him to find his freedom. What if, what if? What if this morning, that's what Jesus wants you to do? Everything inside you is telling you, pull back, pull back, get away. But, the disappointments, the depression or the devil that is pulling you away is not stronger than your will to say, I want to go to Jesus. And if you just do that, what if today would be the day you would find deliverance completely? Am I making sense to you right now? Is there is a possibility. So that's why I said, I may, I may little sound a little heretical right now, but I kind of feel, maybe that's true. Maybe he felt, I need Jesus, and without Jesus, I don't think I can find freedom anymore. And so he made a step towards Jesus. Did you know, in that, in that place, that's the only thing Jesus did? He got down of the shore, as of, the, of the boat into the shore, walked up to this guy, healed him, got back into the boat and gone. Didn't know anything else. It's almost as if Jesus knew this guy is going to come to me. I need to be there at the right time. I need to deliver this guy. What if today Jesus is present just for your sake? And he wants to deliver you today. 
See, when you, when you find freedom in Jesus, you will then realize the kind of authority placed on your life. And you know that even if I'm demon possessed, I still have a place where he's not control over my life. He doesn't have control over me. I just have to make this decision to move to Jesus. Let me close with this thought, okay? The final one. I want to, um, uh, because I don't want to close without talking about this. Uh, uh, for God, he wants you to be alive more than you being free. I'll explain that to you. John chapter 11 is a, is a great um, narrative for us to read where Jesus raised Lazarus from the death. You remember that? Four days after dead, being buried, Jesus came and he rose him from the death. Now I want you to go with me to that place on that day. Four days into the grave, Jesus walks up to the grave. Then he tells people, hey, can you roll the stone? So they roll the stone. Now, the guy who's buried inside is actually um, covered with grave clothes. You know, in those days, they would um, tie you up with grave uh, clothes. They are called grave clothes. Uh, so that you would not move. The body does not move or whatever. And then they bury you, uh, put you into the tomb. So Jesus comes to the tomb, asks the stone to be rolled away, then speaks inside. Chapter, chapter 11, verses 43. Lazarus, come out. Now, Lazarus is dead. Okay? When Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, Lazarus is alive. He was dead. Suddenly, he's got life. That's great. Everybody's cheering outside. Wow. How would Lazarus come out? Nobody's thinking. How would he come out? That fellow is tied up. Didn't Jesus know he's tied up? How come Jesus says the last has come out? We did a series called Grave Robber. Okay? From Mark, Robert, Mark Batterson wrote a brilliant book called Grave Robber. So we kind of took that book and uh, did a study on that uh, in our church a few years ago. So... Uh, talking about this particular incident, I wanted to show how difficult it would have been for Lazarus to come out of the tomb with all the grave clothes. And we actually did that with, with Andrew, Andrew being tied up with everything. Andrew is our production manager. He got uh, completely tied him up and I told him, come out. And it was a struggle. It was a fun to watch hobbling part of it. Thankfully, he didn't fall on his face. He hobbled his way to the middle of the stage. And I'm thinking, that would have, while it, looked, it would have looked really funny, it was a struggle for Lazarus to hobble out of the tomb. How come Jesus did not consider that part? Shouldn't he have sent somebody inside to open the grave clothes? How come Jesus would wait for Lazarus to, come, Lazarus to come out before he would look at somebody and say in verses 44, now remove his clothes, grave clothes. Untie him, that's what he said. Now untie him. But there is a gap between the tomb, uh, uh, you know, inside the tomb and outside of the tomb, right? He had to come out. That's the struggle. That is something inside. Once you're alive, you are then uh, possessed with the capacity to fight your way out of your grave clothes. Somebody is dead, you, you bind them in a the blanket, they stay like that. They won't go anywhere, they'll stay like that. But somebody is alive and you bind them in a blanket, they would first try and ask for help and if there's nobody to help, they will try and do everything in their capacity to get out of you, you get the picture? They will struggle their way out of that. That's the effort that God wants to see from you before you totally experience true freedom. As he came out, then he sent help. Come out of your grave, even though you're alive. You will always be in the grave clothes. Make sense? That's the goal. And for that to happen, you need to remove a mask. We Christians, we're experts in putting a mask. We'll talk about the mask next Sunday. 
Let's close our eyes. All God is asking us for us to be is to be aware that devil cannot do anything to you or to your family. So don't be afraid. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verses 11, is living in you. The power you have is much more stronger, bigger than the one that devil has. Live in authority as a child of God. I want to pray with you right now. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond back to the word. If you've been afraid of what is happening in your life, and you're saying, God, I've been fearful of, of what is happening in my life. I, I want courage. I want courage to use the authority that you have already given to me. I messed up many times, God, but I want to use the authority that you have given to me now. Um, and, and you really want God to help you. I want to pray with you. But some of you are saying, I, you know what, I want the authority, but I don't know if I have enough faith to use the authority. Like the father who brought his son to Jesus, demon possessed his son to Jesus, said to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to deliver my son. And Jesus asked him, do you believe? The father says, I'd like to believe, but I don't have faith. Too many defeats in my life. Too many times I, I got disappointed. I don't know whether I can continue to believe. But the father did something else. He said, I want courage. I want, the I want to exercise my authority, but I don't have enough faith to exercise the authority. Either way, wherever you are right now, you can pray and ask him. He can give it to you. And he would love to give it to you. Courage to exercise the authority. Faith to exercise the authority. God is willing to give that to you. If you say that's what you need, would you like to stand to your feet? And I want to pray with you. Whatever enemy you're facing, doesn't matter. Stand as you stand. You're saying, God, I need help. I need help. I need faith or I need courage. If that is what you are, stand. I would like to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Believe this. You are going to see a victory in your life. You to push you into a place of depression, you are going to have a victory. If you love God and walk in His will, you are in the safe hands of God. So He's going to give you the courage that you need. He's going to give you the faith that you need. Believe it and you will receive it. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray with you right now and then we're all going to join the worship team and sing that, profess it as we say, um, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Father, I want to thank you, God, for everyone who's standing here right now. I stand along with them. And I know what some of them are going through. And I have experienced that, God. I understand the kind of fear uh, that can hold us back from experiencing the true authority that you have given to us, exercising the true authority that you have given to us. Permission to use that authority. And many times, in our, when we face difficult situations, disappointing situations, Fearful, fearful situations. We will be, we are afraid, God. We are afraid to move. We, we get paralyzed in fear. And today, you taught us we don't have to. We have the authority. Devil can only have access. He doesn't have authority over our lives. You are our owner. We belong to you, God. Man, that fills us with such confidence. And I know some of us are struggling with faith. Like we have had too many disappointments. Sometimes it's others' faults. We understand that. And maybe because of all that, we feel we don't have enough faith. We do want you to work in our lives, God. But we feel like we don't have enough faith. Today we ask you, like the Father who asked you, we're asking you, would you give us faith? Faith to believe. It's Christ from the dead. is now living within us. Help us to believe that, God. And now we can face anything. That frame of mind will help us to look at life and things in a totally different way, God. A defeated one is trying to fight against us. He's angry, but he cannot do anything. He's already defeated. Help us to understand that and live our lives in victory, God. Thank you for speaking to us today. 
Thank you, God, that you're going to uh, continue to shape our lives. And next week when we come back, help us to be honest with ourselves, open in your presence, unmask ourselves so that you can work in our lives. Our lives, any area of your life. And then we will close the service. You take what the enemy meant for real and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for real. God, we thank you for your word. And we pray that as we go back from here, help us to walk in victory, in confidence, in assurance of what you're doing in our lives and the kind of authority that you placed in us. Bless our children, God, throughout this week, I pray that your protection would be upon them. Those who are writing their exams, I pray that you'd grant them power as they write their exams, God. May your favor be upon them. And God, give them good health. Um, and we thank you, God, for all our children. We know that they have a wonderful purpose for their lives. More than us, you love them. And so we thank you for your love for our children, God. Bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's do the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the love of our Father and the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Listen, don't.